Thank you for coming to the MIT Center for International Studies Star Forum. Tonight's talk on science policy is one in a series of discussions on policy advice to President-elect Barack Obama. In February, we will discuss America's role in, shaping, in, in the shaping of a new world economy. And leading that discussion will be Martin Feldstein of Harvard University and Simon Johnson of MIT will serve as the discussant. Another event I'd like to mention is we're bringing to campus Mia Kirshner. Ms. Kirshner, an actress, has starred in L Word, Black Dahlia, and 24, to name a few. And she recently published a stunning paper documentary, I Live Here is a Raw and Intimate Journey to Crises in Four Corners of the World. Her public talk will conclude a two-week course that she will be teaching during MIT's independent activities period in January. If you haven't already, please sign up for our Star Forum event announcements, as we have many more in the works. Tonight, for a science policy advice session to our new president, we're honored to have with us Mark Kastner, Donner Professor of Physics and Dean of Science at MIT. We're also honored to have with us Eugene Skolnikoff, Emeritus Professor of Political Science at MIT. Professor Skolnikoff will formally introduce Dean Kastner and he will chair the discussion. I also want to add that we'll be having a Q&A after the discussion, and if you could come down to the mic so we could capture this for the video, that would be appreciated. Professor Skolnikoff has focused his research and teaching interests in the fields of science and public policy and of government organization in a technological age. He received his bachelor's and master's of science at MIT and received a bachelor's and master's in politics and economics at Oxford as a Rhodes Scholar. He then returned to MIT and received his PhD in political science. Professor Skolnikoff served on the White House staff in the office of the science advisor in the administrations of Eisenhower, Kennedy, and Carter. He has served as head of the MIT political science department and as director of the MIT Center for International Studies. He is a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and of AAAS. Please join me in welcoming Professor Skolnikoff. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, well, we have a treat, I think, tonight to hear from Dean Kastner. Uh, let me just say a word first uh, by way of introduction about the whole issue of science policy and based heavily on my own experience. Uh, I did work uh, in the White House on the, when the science office, the science advisory office of the president was first created under the in the Eisenhower administration that was 1957, 58. Uh, and when Jim Killian, uh, then president of MIT, was the first science advisor to the president. I, I was in that office for some five years uh, and came out with a very strong sense of what it means <coughs> and the importance of a president having somebody <coughs> close to him or her uh, who knows something about science and can help not so much in just setting what the policy ought to be in science, but also to in advising the president on the various issues that he's going to or she is going to have to face, uh, presenting options and so forth. I work, had the great uh, benefit of working with first Dr. Killian, then Dr. Kistiakowski of Harvard, chemist, and then Jerry Wiesner that I'm sure many of you know, who was uh, Kennedy's science advisor. And all three of those had a very special relationship to the president they, they worked for. And in both cases of both presidents, uh, they both understood and wanted a kind of in reaction relationship to, the, to a scientist to help them making very difficult decisions. Those were the times of the Cold War and the military uh, tended to dominate things, with a lot of space issues. There began to be some environmental issues. There were issues about education and so on. So many of those continue today, of course. We have a whole set of more issues today. I don't have to tell you. Uh, energy and cl closely related to climate change. Climate change in many ways is an energy issue. Health, economic competitiveness, security issues more generally. If anything, science and technology, it seems to me, are more closely intertwined with the kind of, with American policies more generally, not just for science and technology, than they ever have been. 
and yet the office that advises the president or provides that advice, presumably provides that advice, the Office of Science and Technology Policy, as it exists today, uh, has been downgraded. Uh, and it's, in fact, its headquarters are now up Pennsylvania Avenue, not in the White House anymore. Uh, it, it does, that office does some very useful things. It's very important in budgets and other things, but it is not, has no relationship, basically, to the president uh, himself. Uh, now, with the current president, I don't think that would make much difference. But uh, in the next president, I hope it makes a very big difference. Uh, I don't, do, have no idea, do not know what uh, President-elect Obama, who, who he's going to pick for this job or, or to what extent he is uh, likely to reinvigorate this office and move it closer to him. Uh, he has had, during the campaign, the, an advisory committee of scientists under Harold Varmus, formerly the uh, director of National Institutes of Health, uh, who I'm sure understands this very well, this relate, what this relationship needs to be. So I'm, I'm full of hope. Uh, but it remains to be seen. I've seen no, there have been no leaks or any other indication of, of how uh, President Obama is likely to approach this issue, but uh, as, as a supporter of his, I think he understands, is likely to understand it well, at least I hope so. Uh, let me go on and introduce uh, 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 Mark Kastner, uh, who is, uh, will talk more generally about what science policy is and ought to be, I think is likely to focus heavily because of his background on energy, but perhaps a lot of other things. Uh, Mark joined MIT in 1973. Uh, he's been, he was head of the physics department in uh, 1998 and be, has been named dean a year or so ago in uh, 07. He's a fellow of all of the right organizations, National Academy of Sciences, American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the AAAS, and so on. He's, uh, He's involved in a lot of National Research Council committees involving science and technology. He's also an uh, advisor on basic research to the, in fact, chair of the committee advising in basic research to the Department of Energy, which is the largest supporter of basic physics research in the United States, larger than any of the other agencies. Uh, so he comes from a long line of interest in science and the relationship to government, what it ought to be, what we're, where we're at, and where he thinks we ought to go. Mark? I'm, uh, I'm suffering from a cough, and uh, I'm not uh, used to giving talks which are this political, my wife says I have a political hack. Um, so uh, I'm going to really uh, talk about four suggestions um, for the uh, for the uh, new president, and uh, I've ordered them in increasing difficulty. So my first suggestion is increase the prestige of science and government, and since the prestige is so low now, this is almost trivial. Um, I'll spend most of my time talking about basic re the role of basic research in energy and the environment. Uh, as Jean mentioned, uh, I'm co-chairing a subcommittee of what's called the Basic Energy Sciences Advisory Committee, and that subcommittee is writing a report exactly on this topic, and, and that's why I'm able to say a little bit more valuable things about this than other things. Um, I also want to talk about uh, research at the, at the boundary between life sciences and the other disciplines, which I think is an extremely exciting and important area that the government really should support. And then the hardest thing, which is to stabilize funding, and uh, I'll talk some more about that at the end. So let me talk first, just say a few words. Gene already talked about the science advisor. Clearly, uh, the science advisor in this administration has been almost unnoticeable. And, and it's so important with all of the great challenges facing the country, almost all of them uh, have deep scientific content, and the president should have good scientific advice nearby. Um, 
I think another important thing which has been lost is, is that the government has stopped listening to the experts within the government uh, and, the, and the situation in, with, with Hansen and, the, and uh, uh, climate change is the most gr egregious example where uh, scientists within the government were, were not even allowed to talk about their research. Uh, there, are, there are great, some really great people uh, in the government agencies. Um, uh, I've, I've gotten to know some of the people at the Department of Energy and you know, uh, 30, 40, 35 years, 38 years now, uh, I'm counting wrong, 28 years of saying that the government is the problem uh, causes it to be very difficult to attract good people to the government. Um, but nonetheless, in science, we have some really great people in the government. They have great ideas and we need to listen to them too. Um, and it, as I said before, we need to give them freedom to speak out. Uh, so that's all I'm going to say about uh, science advice. Uh, I really want to talk more about the, the energy problem. So a uh, few things everybody by now knows. Uh, we import the equivalent of 16 million barrels of oil per day, uh, four times as much as we did in 1970. Uh, and that costs a lot of money, and this creates, uh, puts the country in jeopardy. We're also the <coughs> excuse me, second largest em emitter of CO2 and other greenhouse gases, and we must reduce those emissions. Um, clean energy is likely to be a huge industry, and for our economic welfare, we need to be leaders in that industry. Um, and, and the president has said that after stabilizing the economy, energy is his, his highest priority. So this is something which is going to happen, and the question is, how is it going to be done? So I want to, to, to just draw your attention to this, which many of you may have uh, heard about already. It's often called the Wedges Report. Uh, it's... it's, um, it's uh, I don't know if you can see my pointer. I can hardly see it. Uh, uh, Sokolow at Princeton and his, and his collaborators made the argument that if we, <coughs> if we look at <coughs> excuse me, CO2 emissions <coughs> over time, get some water here, and we project out into uh, for 50 years, uh, we just can't live with the increased CO2 emissions. If we want to just have a stable uh, CO2 level, we need to, we need to uh, reduce this triangle of excess CO2. And the argument they make is that you can't do this with one technology, but if you break it down into seven different technologies, each one has a piece of the wedge. Uh, you get seven wedges, and uh, each wedge can uh, make a contribution. And the problem is that um, many environmentalists are saying, well, if you've got these technologies, why not just implement them and make it happen? Um, on the other hand, industry for years has been saying, we don't know how to do any of these technologies, so we just shouldn't do anything. Uh, and of course, the reality is we have to do it, we have to start, but in almost every technology, it's not good enough now. And th there needs to be more research, more science to be done to improve the technologies as we try to implement them at the same time. So I want to give you uh, just a couple of examples of, <coughs> of the technologies that would form these wedges and what some of the scientific challenges are uh, for which we really need basic research. So um, can we inject CO2 uh, underground uh, into, into uh, the pores in the rock? Can we do it efficiently? What happens uh, once we do it? Will it come out? And if it comes out, will it come out slowly? Or will it come out in a big burst? If it comes out in a big burst, it could kill a lot of people because it would asphyxiate them. And, and, and we really don't know much about how that will happen. Um, can, can we <coughs> uh, do something with the carbon dioxide which will keep it uh, in 
in rock formations which have no other use? Um, or do we have problems that it might leak out into uh, water and, and cause problems with water? Um, on the other hand, it's possible that we could combine CO2 with water or with metal ions to put, them in some, to put it in some form which would be maintained permanently. Um, and, and if we do put the CO2 underground, can we monitor it properly? So all of this requires a lot of research in the chemistry and physics of CO2 in rock and liquids. <clears throat> and, you know, I think some people say, well, you know, we just shouldn't burn coal. We shouldn't bother with carbon sequestration. But I think the reality is that with this unbelievably vast supply of coal, which is an extremely cheap fuel, somebody in the world is going to burn it. And we had better figure out how to capture the CO2 and sequester it, and that's going to need a lot of science. So this one example of, of one of the pieces uh, of reducing CO2 and how much we don't really understand about it. Um, a second case is electrical storage. The dream is to have vehicles uh, powered um, by electricity and to make the electricity in some clean way. The problem is that if you want to make an electric car, you need one that can travel 200 miles and there is no battery that is uh, capable of doing that in a car because the batteries are too large in volume, they're too heavy, they're too expensive. And you basically need, I'm sorry, you basically need a five-fold improvement in battery technology in order to have a, an electric car that's really uh, uh, all electric. Um, you also need batteries if you're going to um, stabilize, <coughs> excuse me, you're going to stabilize the power grid. The power grid sometimes has huge peak loads and then it has uh, uh, peak, and then, then the load drops and you need to store the power and the best way to do that is in some chemical way and, and so you need some kind of chemical storage and batteries uh, are one example. In solar energy, um, there's a fundamental limit to the amount of, of uh, sun energy that you convert, can convert into electricity. Um, this limit is 32%, which is pretty good. It means a th roughly a third of the sunlight can be converted directly into electricity. It's far better than photosynthesis, and so compared to biofuels, solar energy is, is far superior. Um, however, um, the problem is that the current best solar cells are made from single crystals which are very expensive. You can make solar cells out of uh, thin films, but they have too low an efficiency. And so what we really need are inexpensive solar materials with higher efficiency, and there's a lot of progress. And, and one can already uh, use the current technologies and, and, and capture a lot of electricity but it would be a huge mistake not to do the research to try to find less expensive, more efficient materials. Furthermore, um, this is another case where you need storage. You need to convert the uh, solar, uh, the electrical energy into some other uh, form of energy so you can use it when the sun's not shining. So there are lots of examples <coughs> of all these technologies which you can find at the website of the Basic Energy Sciences uh, Office of the DOE. Um, over the last five or six years, Basic Energy Sciences had, has done a series of workshops and written a, a report on virtually every area of energy technology and what the basic uh, energy needs are uh, in order to make these things really work. For example, solid state lighting. What do we really need to do to replace um, incandescent lights with uh, light-emitting diodes that would be uh, cheap and efficient? They're much more efficient, but they need to be a lot cheaper. There are many other examples. I really encourage you, if you're interested, to look through these. And if you just look at the introductions, you can, you can get a feeling of what, the, of what the issues are. Now, 
obviously this is uh, energy is now everybody agrees it's the mo one of the <coughs> one of the most important issues facing the country but it's shocking to see how much the country has been actually spending on energy research so um, here are some numbers um, the uh, the amount of R&D in energy declined from 10 percent of the total R&D in 1980 to only 2 percent in 2005 and almost every country in the world followed the same pattern except Japan private R&D has also declined uh, although it recently it picked up because of venture capital in, in, in clean energy technologies. If you compare how much we spend on energy and R&D to other parts of the economy, um, the private energy sector, <coughs> which is really fossil fuel companies primarily, uh, invested only 0.23% of, of revenue in this period. If you compare that with the biotech industry, it invents, invests 39% of its revenue, uh, pharmaceuticals 18%, semiconductors 16%, um, if you look at more conventional industries, electronics invests 8%, and the auto, even the auto industry invests 3%. 3%. Um, and the overall average for R&D investment in the country is 2.6%, so only 10% only of the average. It's unbelievable for such an important uh, area. And we need a huge investment. Um, the International Energy Agency estimated that stabilizing CO2 uh, will require uh, $17 trillion in R&D to make it happen. Um, reducing emissions to 50% 50, 50 below 2005 levels would require $45 trillion. So we, this is, of course, re research and development, but a huge investment is necessary. Unfortunately, our Congress is moving in my view, in the wrong way. Um, if you look at the, the proposed uh, Climate Security Act that was uh, proposed by these uh, three folks in the last Congress, it would provide only 436 million per year in R&D, which is extra, but that's only 20%, 18% more than what is being invested already. So it doesn't even come close to any of the recommendations uh, uh, of that, that the, the world says we need, that the experts say we need. And the problem is they, they propose getting this money from a cap and trade system and that money will actually only come out late in the cap and trade process whereas the research should really be front end loaded. And so you, you, you really need to uh, invest in, in R&D now with, with avail with, with, uh, um, baseline appropriations and then add the re revenues from cap and trade later on. <coughs> so we can, I'm, I'll uh, answer whatever questions I can answer uh, when I finish, but that's basically the theme uh, on, on energy is there are huge challenges. We need to do basic research as well as implementing technology and we're not coming near to investing at the level we should. Now let me turn now just for a few moments to the third revolution in, in life science research. So the first revolution really was Watson and Crick, the discovery of DNA. Um, that led to an understanding uh, of uh, cells and diseases based on molecular biology. Um, this led to genetic engineering and, and some new therapies and really resulted in the entire biotech industry. The second revolution is genomics, and this building is a monument to genomics, um, mapping the entire genome. It was made possible by sophisticated technology and huge computer power. So this already is, is very, um, already beginning a, um, a merging of, of uh, fields outside with biology with biology. And of course, this allows the identification of, of the genetic basis uh, for many diseases. Um, many of us think that there's a third revolution, 
uh, beginning in, in the life sciences, which brings together biologists with mathematicians, physical scientists, and engineers to solve biomedical problems. This is, as I already said, this, this convergence has already played a role in genomics, but it's going to play an even bigger role moving forward. Um, a good example uh, is this building which is going up across the street, the Koch Institute for Integrative Cancer Research. It's going to bring together a dozen engineers and a dozen molecular biologists, and they're going to work together on problems related to cancer. Um, if you read the Newsweek article uh, in September, it began out by saying, there's a special article on cancer, it began by saying, we fought cancer and cancer won. There was a huge investment beginning with the uh, Nixon war on cancer in the, in, in the mid-1970s, and out of that uh, investment, we learned a huge amount about the basic science, uh, the basic underlying molecular biology of cancer, but it has been frustrating that so little of that has actually led to actual uh, early detection and therapy. Uh, and, and that's because cancer is just, cancer is of course many diseases and they are very clever at circumventing everything we do with molecular biology. Um, but it, there's a great hope that, that this uh, convergence of the life sciences, of the uh, molecular biology with the other sciences and engineering will really have great breakthroughs, and the Koch Institute is, is, a, is, is a test of whether that's going to happen or not. Um, out of genomics <coughs> and the other technologies, there's a huge amount of, of new information which is being generated, and, and the, it's impossible at the present time to actually use it all. Uh, and so we're really at a stage now where biology needs theory for the first time, really needs integrating ideas uh, to take all this information and, and come up with clar clarity. And uh, so this is a very exciting time, and the country really should invest in it. And finally, I, I want to say a few words about stabilizing science funding. And, and by stabilizing, uh, what I mean can, can be shown here. So this shows uh, funding in, in the different areas of science uh, since about 1988. And you can see that the uh, mathematical and physical sciences and engineering have been pretty flat. Engineering got a, big, a little bit of a bump up here in 2000. Um, my own field, uh, uh, physics, has uh, been very, very flat. This is in constant dollars, so in just taking out some nominal uh, CPI inflation, and of course, uh, research inflation is much larger. So in fact, there's been a decline in most of these fields. But you see, in, in the life sciences, uh, there was a decision made to double the, the, the NIH budgets. And here you can see it goes from about uh, 12 uh, to 25. So there's the doubling of the NIH budget. But then look what happened. After the doubling, it started to go down. And, and of course, it's, it's actually flat, but it's going down because of inflation. This is extraordinarily unhealthy uh, way of, of funding science. Um, someone who uh, went into a molecular biology lab as a graduate student in 2000, uh, then spent six years as a graduate student and six years as a postdoc, and came out in uh, 2000, well, that's like 2000, that would be 2012, so they're not yet coming out yet, and, and they, they went into the field at a time when everything looked fabulous, and they came out when the field was overpopulated, and there's not enough money. Uh, the, now the mean age for the first NIH grant is 42 years old. Um, this is a horrendous situation. Um, I think, you know, uh, of course it's wonderful to see more money to go to science, but to give this kind of rapid increase over a short period of time is extremely unhealthy. And it's extremely unhealthy to, to fund one area of science and not the rest. Because the reality is, as Harold Varmus has pointed out so clearly, uh, the different sciences reinforce each other, and the scientific enterprise cannot, uh, cannot do well if only one field of science is supported and not the others. We need 
a, a more gradual, um, uh, 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 stable funding pattern if we're going to have a healthy science community. Um, and I should say that the reason I, I talked about this last is it is the hardest because you, you can get Congress once in a while to double a budget, but then they'll stop. Uh, and, and there's a big push now to double the budget for the physical sciences uh, because of the uh, wonderful gathering, uh, uh, rising above the gathering storm report of the National Academies. And I fear that if that doubling does play, take place, we will again have a very painful period after the doubling is over. It's better to have, it, have the doubling than not, but I would rather see uh, a more stable long-term uh, funding profile. So I'm going to stop there and uh, uh, ask, open the floor for questions, and I'm, I'm asked to uh, encourage you to use the microphone so that your uh, wise questions can be recorded. I see Aaron's coming to the microphone here. Good. Try to be good. Uh, this is really not a question, it's more of a suggestion. And um, uh, look, your list is terrific. And, you know, I agree with 100%. So I want to talk about something that wasn't there. Okay. And it's, it's nuclear arms control and nonproliferation. And, you know, I come from, I'm, I'm sort of the son of Weisskopf and people like that, Phil Morrison, you know, people who made the bomb and, and tried to put the genie back in the bottle, okay? Because we're responsible. Uh, we, we scientists have to be responsible for what we create. It's great to create things, and, but then, then we have to own them. And, and uh, so, so I come from that generation, you know, or the children of that generation. And, and this is something that I think both science and MIT, as the place it is, has to really be at the forefront of. And so coming to Obama and where we are, uh, there's the Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty. There are these five-year reviews. Uh, 2009 is, is a conference <coughs> which gets organized for the 2010 review. 2005 review was a disaster. And here we are in this situation where there are countries like Iran and, and, and North Korea, and, and we're scared out of our wits because they're developing weapons. And we have to keep, we have to go back as a country to leading, you know, the reduction of nuclear weapons, the, being good ourselves, you know, is setting a good example. And, and also, we, we just very politically, we have to pass uh, the nuclear, you know, the, the nuclear weapons testing ban, you know, it has to go through the Senate. So there are many issues. I don't want to give a huge speech, but there are many issues in, in this arena, uh, reductions, you, you know, and Article 6 of the Nonproliferation Treaty that we have to live up to, you know, and that calls for us to eventually abolish nuclear weapons. I agree. Hi, thank you so much for your talk. It's been really enjoyable. I have a question about uh, federal models for the energy problem. So uh, models similar to DARPA, the ARPA-E model, has been passed but not appropriated. And so I know that there's been a lot of talk of getting that appropriated under the new administration, but there's also the criticism that the DOE already has programs in place that are just not being utilized entirely and that RPE would be more redundant. <coughs> Can you talk about that? Thanks. Well, um, I don't understand it well enough to actually have a, a, an opinion about RPE. I think, um, ARPA has been uh, ex ARPA or DARPA has been very successful for the Defense Department, but I think it's 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 a very different industry. Uh, if if DARPA comes up with a technology, um, uh, they all they you know all they have to do is tell the Air Force or the Army or the Navy that that need, this needs to be purchased, and there will be some customer there will be some company that will produce it. 
uh, I think the energy industry is just so different because the problem is we have established energies, uh, energy industries which are making huge amounts of money. And in, for each of these technologies to work, we have to somehow uh, change the whole uh, economic structure. And I'm just not sure an organization modeled on DARPA is, is capable of doing that. So I have misgivings about it, but I, I'm certainly not an expert. Hi. Uh, thanks very much for this talk. It's been very interesting. And uh, I was just surprised to hear that the, the space program didn't get a mention, not necessarily because I think it's um, the right, the right thing, but it's just for a long time been a very public face of what science means in America. So I was wondering, do you see it continuing to play that role? And if not, what can the government do to, to put that same exciting face that the space program once gave for science in America? Uh, what, what will take its place if not that? So um, I didn't mention the, the space program because um, I think that this uh, personally I think that the, the previous administration's commitment for us to go to the moon and Mars has been an unmitigated disaster. Uh, you know, all of the, the funding that was going into interesting uh, science related to space and astrophysics has just disappeared uh, because of this, uh, what I think is a totally silly uh, enterprise. Uh, you know, one, one can say that when we first set, had a space program, it excited a lot of people. Um, uh, but, um, you know, I think we could have an equal, uh, equally exciting program uh, dedicated to uh, alternative energies, uh, which would be much more valuable to the country. Um, unfortunately, you know, the aerospace industry uh, now is uh, dependent on this effort to go to the to the moon, and uh, with Barbara Mikulski back in uh, power of her committee, I just can't anticipate that changing, and so I didn't mention it because it's even harder than these other things. Thanks. Let me just, if, if I might take just a comment, this on. Hello, hello. Well, there you go. There you go. Uh, just both of this and this question and the first one about nuclear uh, proliferation and weapons and so on. Uh, the, these are two excellent examples of where the role of the scientific community, and I, this I mean both the scientific and the engineering community, in terms of lobbying and influence in Washington is very, is terribly important. Uh, on the nuclear proliferation issue of, and foreign policy, it seems to me that that is the issue that we face. That's the most dangerous issue that we face. Uh, in fact, MIT is quite, has been uh, traditionally <coughs> quite involved in, in lobbying on the issue. The Union of Concerned Scientists began here. It's been an effective organization on that issue. On the space program, the same, not as dangerous, but I, I couldn't agree with you more, Mark, that, that what it's done in the NASA is li literally to cut the programs on Earth resource satellites. Uh, and that is the one thing we need for climate change research from NASA. Not the one thing, but it's the major thing. And yet the Mars and moon mission and moon mission have both had a direct effect on how the budget application. And there, uh, it's, it both speaks to the importance of the scientific community becoming engaged in these issues. It also speaks to the importance of having somebody in the White House who has the ear of the president can point out what the problems are and what he has to do about it. for the talk. Um, I guess uh, if you talk, if you read an article from scientists from different fields, uh, it seems that there's all these big issues, energy, nuclear proliferation, the environment, and you read any given article and it seems that's the biggest concern for science. Um, but of course in the end someone has to make a decision that this amount goes here, this amount goes here. What's the percentage of our um, GDP that should be spent on science? Like what, in the end, how, how are we, Someone, it seems that someone should quantify what is the effect on our country, on our economy of these individual problems, and uh, where does this get all balanced out, I guess, is the question. So, you know, um, I, again, this is not my area of expertise, sure. but there have been uh, experts at MIT and other places, Bob Solo is famous, for studies of 
the uh, effect on the economy of investments of science, we are way below the level where, where we're maxing out on the impact uh, the economy could have by increasing investments in science. I don't know what the numbers are, but our, our investments are not large as a fraction of GDP compare, compared to uh, some of our competing countries. Um, and, um, you know, the investments of science are really small compared to the uh, size of, of anything in the federal budget. Mm -hmm. The problem with the federal budgets are, and, you know, I, I, I have to say that the last three years has shown us, uh, because of the re Gathering Storm report and Thomas Friedman's articles, uh, there was an unbelievable consensus in both houses of Congress and the administration, both parties, that we should double the NSF budget and the energy budgets for research. Uh, everybody agreed. And then every year when the uh, budget debates happened, at the last minute it was eliminated. The problem is, as, as one congressional uh, staffer told uh, one of the committees I'm on, the federal government is an insurance company with an army. All the money goes for Medicare, Medicaid, uh, Social Security, and the Defense Department. And everything else is small and, and gets squeezed. And research, unfortunately, is in that part. So I think in the, in going forward with the trillion dollar deficits we're going to see, the expectation of significant increases broadly in science, I just don't believe it's going to happen. Uh, we've heard that all of the government agencies have already been uh, asked to think about what they would do with significant cuts in their budgets. I think the only uh, bright spot is energy research because it's such a pressing problem. So I think it's just the realities. And I, I think that, you know, trying to think about some logical uh, scenario of what should be funded at what level is almost irrelevant. Okay. Thank you. Um, as you just said, uh, energy policy is clearly a pressing issue. And um, in order to avert climate catastrophe, something needs to be done soon. So that uh, speaks to a large, dramatic increase in the amount of funding available. How do we do that and not get into the situation that the NIH is currently in? How do we increase the amount of money we spend um, without creating a bubble of new graduate students who end up being unemployed? <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> well, I think um, you can do it by increasing funding, not just at the universities, but also at the national laboratories so that there will be more opportunities for those students to get jobs. Um, I think that this is a case where uh, the reality is the amount of money that will be spent on basic research will not be so huge that it will disrupt the system. The problem is that there's a tendency to put all the money into technology development and to put all the money into encouraging uh, the implementation of current technologies. So I, I doubt that we're going to get such an increase in the, in the DOE basic energy sciences budget that we'll have too many basic scientists working on this problem. And I think the reality is there's going to be a burgeoning uh, industry for them to go into uh, if they do get PhDs in this field. Thanks a lot for the talk. Uh, I would imagine that the number of people with degrees is going up fairly steeply. So if the science is leveled off in real dollars and then the number of people with PhDs and other degrees is going up, obviously that's going to cause a lot of problems. I'd like you to talk about that a little bit. Secondly, I'd like you to talk a little bit about <coughs> the shift in basic research spending from institutes like the NIH and NSF to military institutes like DARPA and, DO and uh, ONR. I work in an area of brain-machine interfaces, and it is impossible to get any funding from NIH or NSF to do any research like that. But the military does seem to be throwing a lot of money at the problem. I don't know how intelligently they're designing their programs, but they at least are opportunities. So maybe you could talk a little bit about that shift in spending from the 
uh, the non-military agencies to the military agencies. So, I mean, my perspective is it's just the opposite. Uh, uh, in the 1960s and 70s, the military was a major supporter of basic energy research. Uh, and, you know, even through the 90s, DARPA uh, funded, uh, you know, quite a bit of long-range research in computer science. Um, uh, although the uh, uh, Defense Department stopped supporting research in the physical sciences a long time ago. Um, and, uh, you know, I, don't, I think that the, the Defense Department is not a major uh, supporter of basic science anymore. Um, in terms of the uh, population issues, I think it is an issue. And I think it's something we have to think about. I think um, uh, what has been happening in the life sciences is that the growth in the biotech industry has been able to absorb a lot of the uh, uh, PhDs that have been produced. Um, but I think that there's, there's a problem in that uh, uh, a number of organizations, particularly uh, medical schools, have um, hired a lot of uh, people and, and uh, you know, they give them an empty lab and then they're expected to pay their own salary and, and pay for all their research out of grants. And then uh, the grants are now not available, and I think there's going to be a, a, a kind of a crisis there. And I think we have to think about those things as, as we do this funding. We really have to think about whether there will be industries to, 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 uh, to absorb these people. Well, let me just, on the budget, the, uh, it is what Mark said is absolutely right. The Defense Department supports very little basic research. But most of the increase in R&D in the last several years has been for applied, engine, applied technology in right. at defense uh, and not in any of the civilian right. agencies. That's right. But it's very applied. Yep. Thank you again for your presentation. Um, you underlined two very prominent things that are talked about today, battery technology and solar. But unfortunately, most people don't know this, both these technologies are heavily resource dependent. We've already seen extreme volatility in the solar sector, and we're already seeing a very limited supply of lithium ion, at least high grade, the type you would need for battery technology. What do you think are the appropriate measures that the government has to do to prepare for such volatility in these very uh, finite resources? Well, I don't know much about this. I don't think in, in, for silicon solar cells there's a resource issue. Well, we're, I mean, back in 2006, you know, that's when we started seeing crazy, the price of silicon moving, very volatile. I understand there wasn't enough produced, but, you know, if you look at things like cadmium telluride and things that are coming out of this, you know, the fin film market, we're talking about very finite resources. So, so this, I mean, I think it, you know, uh, this is why we need to do a lot of research and, and to, to find out options. And, and you know, the, the marketplace presumably will take care of it. If, if the solar cell is very expensive, it won't work. It won't be, it won't be effective, right? Um, so, I, you know, I don't, I don't know what one can do about that. And just to continue on, even though some of, these, some of these items are being sold right now, you know, for instance, uh, cadmium telluride solar cells, they are actually the, some of the cheapest thin film cells being sold right now. Uh, because people, just like what we couldn't see with oil, the whole oil, you know, yeah. hit, hitting the peak, you know, oil is not priced to its limited supply that we have. Yeah. Uh, you know, people are saying we're going to hit peak in 25 years. Um, oil is not priced to that, so I don't see how the investors who are thinking on a short-term cycle are going to realize this limited cycle, and aren't we just going to fall, or bring ourselves to another pitfall? Uh, it could could be a problem. I, I I don't know what to say about that one. Uh, close. If, if there's anyone in Congress um, who you think really gets it, and if there's you know, sort of what the proportion is of people who get it to people who don't, and if there's anything that we can do to support those people or to, to bring that. So I, I think there are a small number of people who get it. Most of them don't. Uh, most of them want to see something happen fast, and therefore it's easier to, to invest in, in existing technologies. Uh, than, than to do the basic research. Uh, I think, you know, there are, you know, write to your congressman and tell them that, that basic science is important. That's, that's the only thing to do. Thanks. Hi, um, I kind of had a question regarding, um, recently I read in the New York Times an article or an editorial article that was a little uh, disconcerting to me in which um, 
no longer is the United States um, concerned about the fact that math and science is no longer a priority um, to kids and teaching kids proper math and science. Um, recently, I think I heard that in a lot of schools in America, or a small minority of schools in America, the theory of evolution is no longer being taught. Um, I was wondering if you had any opinion on if there's anything the government can do to change the mindset that Americans uh, going into the 21st century need to have a lot of experience um, in, and background in math and engineering if we want to be able to lead um, a technolo technological revolution. So this is obviously a huge problem. Uh, you know, the fact that, that you know, evolution is not taught in some schools is mind-boggling. Uh, uh, there, there is an effort uh, by a number of agencies in the government to try to uh, improve math, uh, math and science education. The NSF has, has a lot of activities to try to do this. We need more. There are private, there are private in, uh, institutions and foundations that are, are working on this. Uh, um, I think it's, I don't believe that this is something that's getting lost. I think that there's a, a large interest in this, and I think that the, the, the most important voice is the business community. Uh, and, and, you know, Massachusetts is an example where, where education reform took place because the business community said they needed a workforce with stronger math and science skills. Um, and, and, you know, I think uh, uh, there will be continued improvement, but it's a tough battle. Uh, way back in the beginning, before the energy stuff, we, uh, one of the early uh, points was that it would be good to increase the prestige of the research community in, within the new administration. And I want to just ask, what are some practical ways to do that? I mean, obviously you could take a, a uh, Nobel laureate like, like Varmus and make, give him a uh, higher office and make him, give him something to do, make him deputy director of OMB or something too, I suppose. But other, other than that, what are the practical things that we can now do to, uh, to, 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 to sort of resurrect the, the standing? and the symbolic standing of, of science in their administration. Why don't you take that one, John? <laughs> uh, well, I think there are several things that, that really have to be done, and I, I hate to use an uh, easily, often overused word of leadership. Uh, I think a statement from a new president on coming out of the White House that would, uh, would say something about the significance and the importance of of support for science and technology and for training and education in science and technology would have a rather surprising effect. Uh, but that obviously isn't all of it. Uh, one reason for wanting to see a, a more of a resurrection of that White House science office, and I, I want to be careful because it's not as though the existing office, OSTP, doesn't do some useful things. It does. But it, it doesn't have much clout. It doesn't have much influence with the Congress. Uh, and you have to remember what the congressional process is like. There are the uh, authorization committees are the ones that sort of speak substantively about a subject. There is a House Science Committee that is a very good one, typically, and uh, has some good reports. And it's got essentially no influence on what happens in the Congress. Uh, and even when it does pass authorizations, the appropriations committees are the ones that really call the tune and uh, on how much money is actually allocated. And, there, and that, the, it's, it's the Appropriations Committee congressmen that are the mo most important to try and reach. And that's got to come from, uh, especially now with a Democratic <coughs> Congress, a Democratic President, uh, it's got to come from the White House. And I think that could make a huge difference, in fact. Hi, Dean Kastner. Uh, thank you again for the talk. Uh, you guys expressed sort of your distaste for the projects such as the Mars and Moon missions as diverting resources away from more important issues from, for NASA. Similarly, as a bi biologist research on diabetes, I was very upset when so much money was put, put towards bioterrorism uh, a few years back. Now, during these painful budget times and financial times, if you had to say we need to divert money away from certain projects in science to the president, what would you rec recommend? Well, I don't know if it's a valuable question because I think that, uh, as Jean just said, the budget process is so arcane that it does, just doesn't work that way. Uh, in the physics community, uh, our, our, we did this experiment with the, solid, with the superconducting super collider 
uh, where a lot of the members of the physics community opposed it because they said that it was going to take away resources from things that were more important. Um, and of course, that it was then killed and the resources didn't show up anywhere in science. Uh, and so I think that it's, it's, it's not a, a valuable kind of uh, 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 argument. I think NASA is a special case because it's a single agency which was doing uh, a lot of uh, fundamental research, uh, uh, looking at Earth resources, uh, as Gene mentioned, um, sending uh, probes out to distant uh, planets, um, uh, studying the cosmic microwave background. Um, and by making the decision that NASA had to go to the moon and Mars, it basically forced NASA to take all the resources out of all the basic science. So it was a single agency, and, and that's why I think that's a case w where you can really say it was, a, you know, it was a huge mistake. Once you have different agencies, there are going to be different committees, and it's hopelessly complicated. Let, let me just also illustrate with what the political problem is. The, the SSC was very popular in the Congress until the site was selected. Then it was in that was exactly. Texas. And uh, the uh, uh, Speaker of the House had, had uh, just recently been kicked out for, some, for a scandal, and uh, they lost all their political power. It just happened again in the energy area with, uh, what do they call it, COGEN. Yeah. Uh, this uh, big Department of Energy... <coughs> Uh, experimental program to build a large coal-fired clean, quote, clean coal plant, but one that would sequester carbon, would uh, capture the carbon and then experiment with sequestering. Now, it, it went way over budget. There were all kinds of other problems, but it still was very popular until the site was selected. That was Illinois and others, all the other states and kind of lost interest in it. question relating to a few other questions and what was said about influencing science policy. What do you think that we as individual scientists could most effectively do to influence policy and then public opinion? I think, I think the most effective thing anybody can do, including scientists, is to talk to your representatives. I mean, they are very sensitive to what their constituents are saying. And, you know, uh, I, I actually, uh, in some earlier budget crisis, I sent letters to um, John Kerry and Ted Kennedy. Um, I asked them to strongly support the National Science Foundation. And I very, got very polite letters back from them saying I do support the NIH very strongly. Uh, and uh, fortunately, Barney Frank, who is my uh, representative, actually asked me to come and see him and we had a discussion about it and I think that you know once in a while your representative will actually listen to you and I think that's the, the, the way you can have the biggest impact. Hi, I'm Jonathan King from Biology. Uh, two um, things I'd like to kind of add to your list. Um, we know that uh, health uh, will be a major issue in, in the administration, right, given the debates, given the situation, enormous costs. And of course, far and away, the most humane and the most economically effective way to improve the health status of the nation is to prevent disease. So in the late 60s and early 70s, there was a growth of the environmental movement, National Institute of Environmental Health, uh, National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health, there was a real focus on what causes disease and lots of major discoveries, asbestos and cancer, vinyl chloride and liver cancer, et cetera. <coughs> that, that has disappeared with the growth of the pharmaceutical industry, which is, of course, sells, needs sick people to sell products to. We have the focus on the sick individual, you know. So now we have the Cancer Genome Project that focuses on the damage done and is totally silent on the question of what caused <coughs> We have undergraduates who believe that people get lung cancer because they have cancer genes, right, rather than because they, they smoke. So th with the point you made about the intersection between life science and physics and the energy concern, because certainly, you know, pollution is, a, it seems to me this, it's important to reemphasize identifying the causes of disease. And there's no agency in government now uh, that, that deals with that. So that needs some some new thrust. 
The second point, you, you and the young woman raised the question of science education, and you referred to the Gathering Storm report. That report, though it's excellent, really focuses on the vocational aspect of science and technology, you know, to do better in the economy. And uh, for the last 25 years, the number of Americans graduating college has been flat between 26 and 28 percent. You know, we're in this age of science and technology. You think more and more of the population is getting an advanced education. It's not true. Um, and I think we need scientists to advocate that in the age we're moving into, every American has to have some basic understanding of, you know, of genetics and uh, what, uh, what's happening in the up, uh, up atmosphere. And so if we educators don't advocate for increasing access, um, you know, to that kind of education, I think, you know, we'll, we'll be in, in trouble. Just one last thing people have say had, had you influence um, your politician. So I'm old enough, I've been the campaign chairman, you know, for city council candidates and state rep candidates and things like that. We have a, a, an, a, an influential uh, congressman, Michael Capuano. His history is the local politics of Somerville, right? He was uh, the mayor of Somerville. Don't write him, you can write him a letter, but what you should do is get together with a bunch of other graduate students or postdoctoral fellows at a couple institutions, people who live and work in the district. And here in the district, not in Washington, you ask him to meet with you. And he will meet uh, with you because you guys, I hope, are registered to vote in the district, right? And if there's five of you, then he knows, oh, you know how to communicate and how to organize. That's the key. That's how we got, the, w the way we got the NIH budget doubled years back was to stop having meetings in Washington and send the word out to biochemists and cell biologists across the country saying, in your district, right, you get together with scientists in your district, talk to the congressman in your district, talk about the importance of health care and research in your district. That, that's the key to influencing the Congress. Good comments. Thank you. You talked about um, restoring the stature of science in government, and you mentioned Jim Hansen, who was this NASA scientist who was kind of a, a big advocate against climate change, and he was sort of, he was censored by the administration. And I'm wondering, um, <coughs> is all that going to go away now that we have a president who uh, ostensibly respects science? I mean. Um, if you look at the way the institutions such as the Food and Drug Administration and the Environmental Protection Agency, how they work, I don't think we can just uh, blame the Bush administration for, for failures. You know, uh, for example, in the FDA, the, the burden of proof is almost on the, on the patient to say, this drug is making me sick, we need to get it off the market. You know, it's already on the market, it's already killed people. Um, you know, so how, how do we fix these institutions so that we, in the case of the FDA, we keep people healthy, uh, we, don't, we don't make them sick, and in the case of the EPA, that we actually protect the environment instead of, in both cases, um, really just serving moneyed interests. So, you know, I, I, I look, I, I agree these are horrendous situations. I, I believe it all comes from the top. You know, I mean, FEMA was a, an excellent organization under the Clinton administration, and look at what happened with Katrina. It doesn't take very long for a new president to destroy a good organization. It's much harder to uh, fix things when they're broken. Uh, but I think that if there's, a, if there's a real belief on the part of the president that science is important and that you know, uh, knowledge is important and facts are important, I think it'll, it'll trickle down to every agency. Well, it, I can't help but add, but <laughs> The, if, there's never, never will be an agency that's perfect or, or ones that are all bad. And the ex particular examples you gave have to do with the legislation and what the responsibility of the agency is rather than that there was a, a, a concerted effort to downplay the science. Uh, I'm afraid, however, in this administration, we have seen, I have seen, I'll make it a personal remark, a level of disdain for scientific evidence and fact, which I find <coughs> absolutely incredible. It's brazen. Uh, with the appointment of people in various places who simply overruled what the scientists were saying. Uh, and that will change uh, with any administration that takes science and scientific evidence uh, seriously. 
Uh, but the more fundamental issue or systemic issue is whether how the agencies are structured to respond to scientific evidence, whether they should do things to prevent disease or respond to disease or respond to toxic chemicals. And that's a different kind of an issue. That's a fundamental question of the agency organization and structure. So with regards to science funding, um, I, I, don't, I imagine that we're going to be having this discussion every eight years, every 16 years. But what can we do to change the game? What proposals are there that change the rules of how science funding happens? For example, can we make it self-sustaining? Perhaps with a little bit of investment, um, we could improve the way that we have translation of technology and research from the universities to industry, get more licensing fees and so on. So what do you know about that? I don't have a clue. <laughs> I, you know, I, you know, if you you look at you look at other countries, some of them do it better, some of them do it worse. Um, you know, I I think I, you know I don't I don't even I don't I don't I don't even know how to think about that. You have any gonna, comments? Well, just for, no, one thing, you're not going to have much time to th much uh, useful thinking to do it in the immediate future because we're not going to have any money. Right. So it. Uh, it there is a more serious, longer-range problem of how do you get a larger proportion of the, of the what I call the non-defense budget, or how do you bring the defense budget down uh, so that you have more money to pay for to, to do in the civilian sector. But there's also going to be this huge explosion in in the need for funds for Social Security and and Medicare, and you know this is this is going to overwhelm everything unless we solve that. So I think yeah. you know that's. In my mind, that's just this looming giant which is going to gobble us all up. Medicare, not so. Social Security is easy. <laughs> Medicare, right. Hi. Um, I have a question about the uh, cap and trade uh, comments. Um, you mentioned that they were a backloaded uh, way of raising money for research, and I wondered if that included cases where you auctioned off uh, the permits uh, for carbon, um, and if. Uh, if not, how feasible is it to include So I, I don't understand this very well, and, and I got these, this information from the MIT Washington office that is, you know, has more expertise, uh, but I think it does include uh, the auction, uh, and it's just that somehow at the beginning they don't get much money, and I don't, I don't understand it very well, and I think you know, it could be, depend on the details of how the cap and trade is done. Do, do you have any? Some. Uh, the, the question basically, as I understand, is, is whether when you give out permits to industry, permits to put carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, do you give them out based on what the industry was doing or do you auction them and force the industry to, to pay for them? Uh, auction makes a lot more sense in many ways, but it immediately looks exact to the public like a, a carbon tax. Okay. Uh, because that will, the more you pay, the industry pays for the, <coughs> for the permits, the more the, it raises the price of the electricity or the fuel. Uh, so there will be, I think, especially early on, a very strong pressure not to auction, to give out the permits and have them trade the permits. Uh, the European system, which has been in operation now for quite a few years, uh, started out uh, without a, uh, giving out the permits. They misjudged how much. But quite apart from that, they're said to have failed because the price of carbon collapsed. It didn't. <laughs> I mean, it didn't fail. It, it did collapse because they gave out too many permits. Now, they're, the next phase, they're going to go to a partial auction system. But I'm sure anything that we do will start out being given out, not auction, because it, because the public won't pay for it. Thanks for this talk. It's been really delightful hearing the discussions. I have two questions. One is to do with the energy policy. We often talk about <coughs> science's role in technology for clean technology, but not necessarily on conservation. Um, and I've, you know, the US, average US citizen spends maybe five to 20 times what people in developing countries spend in terms of their, their carbon footprint. Absolutely. And what can we do as scientists to talk about policy implications of conservation consumer patterns uh, are there things the Obama administration can do to make it uh, 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 more easy for incentives people can have to conserve, to, to do things differently? So that's for me is foremost, yeah. especially in this um, economic climate. 
Uh, the second point I was going to ask is about uh, models for public-private partnerships. And we've talked a little bit about industry's role in this, but looking at models that maybe have been done in Europe where they've gotten the industry or the private sector to, to take a role, uh, can we get Exxon, Shell, and these companies <coughs> to invest you know, at least 5% of their R&D on some public-private partnerships where they have cross-licensing, shared intellectual property, ways of putting an agenda out there, why should the onus be only on the government to do that? So, do you, do you well, want the, <coughs> uh, In fact, no, I'm, I'm not going to defend the oil companies, last thing I would uh, think, but they are giving a fair amount of money to the universities, and to, including MIT, for research on climate change and a lot of other things. Nothing, I think your figures are exactly right, nothing in proportion to the sales that they could have, in fact, afford. Uh, only if they've only begun to recognize that, they, that their stake in this whole climate change, some of them were more quickly than others. Uh, <coughs> the, the slowest one has been Exxon, but it's, even it is beginning to, to change and, put, uh, but, uh, and, and to put money into R&D and recognize that it has a future in that. Don't believe the ads on television. They're, they're, they're much too kind to the, to the companies. On, con on conservation, I think the reality is we need a carbon tax. We're going to have conservation. But that, that is uh, conservation and efficiency are the two things we can do most easily, most quickly. Absolutely. Biggest uh, and at least cost. That's correct. Thank you for your talk. I enjoyed it very much. I had a comment um, along the lines of what can we do most quickly and most uh, economically piggybacking on the comment on preventive medicine and diabetes prevention, I would say that um, Obama has said a number of times during his campaign he's going to need all of us to help. And I would say that the MIT community has an awful lot of respect back in your hometowns. For those of you who are students or graduate students or, or even professors, if you ever get back home and go to your middle school or go to your high school and say, you know, Science and math is fun. You know, look what I'm doing. I came through the same educational pathway you did, and this is really great, and this is what I'm devoting my life to. And oh, by the way, did you know that two-thirds or more of our diabetes is caused by lifestyle choices? And it doesn't cost anything except a good pair of comfortable walking shoes for all of us to walk half an hour a day and to eat right. And I'm doing that as an MIT researcher or graduate student. Why don't you consider getting a program started back in our, you know, in our home school district, something like that. So I think we need to be very clever about um, encouraging uh, President-elect Obama to set an example, which fortunately he will. His family is healthy, he plays basketball, his kids do sports. I mean, he sets a good example of uh, preventive medicine himself. I think they try to eat well. And he's even stopped smoking. He's stopped smoking, which is, which is actually great to have yeah. had a former yeah. smoker fighting this as the president right. and, and to say how hard it is, but he's doing it. But I think that you all can set an example and really, um, you know, without the pharmaceutical company funding and a lot of other things other than, you know, getting some comfortable shoes and, and talking to your hometown schools, uh, you can do a lot. That's great. Thank, Thank you. you. Well, I think we run short of questions and which I think is just about on time. So I'll thank you all for coming and thank Mark for the talk. Thank you. That was great, thanks.